so extremely interesting. Um, so it's, I'm very happy to, uh, to be here and talk a bit about what we've been doing. And I'm trying to show you guys the kind of things that we do with an eye towards um, visualization challenges that we have, of which there are many. Uh, and proteomics is a bit underserved in that respect, because of course you all think single cell sequencing is so much more exciting. Um, but I'm here to try and hopefully convince you that there's other things too. Um, and I would like to start with this uh, very famous painting by Vincent van Gogh, uh, known as The Starry Night, um, for a very simple reason. So this painting came out uh, in a time for art that is known as the modern era. And the modern era was very interesting because it was a very optimistic time. So we can, it's difficult for us to imagine optimistic times, perhaps. But these were optimistic times because science and technology were changing the world. And they were changing the world by having by giving people a new way of looking at the world. And this is what you see reflected in the art. So the visualization follows the new things in science and technology. And I think in proteomics, we're in a modern time. So our tools are changing the way we look at the entity, a protein. And this, in turn, will require our visualization of that proteome to change quite dramatically. And to be quite honest, the field has not spent a lot of time and attention to that, but it soon will have to. And if any of you are interested, then you, it would be nice to be prepared for that uh, because you will have some success, I think. So I'll very briefly go through MS-based proteomics because I'm sure for most of you that is something you've never heard of. A very quick primer on the challenge there. Um, then how we optimize analytics by predicting how analytes behave. I like to think that we were amongst the pioneers in that uh, particular area of research. Um, then how we can leverage these predictions to do unprecedented immunopeptide identification, which is a really big thing because it's something that's a lot harder to do with sequencing, to find actual expressed epitopes on MHC complexes. Then how we leverage the tools in, in something a little bit more audacious, which is what we call a next-gen proteomic search engine, um, which we gave the fantastic name IronBot. And then I'll talk about some IronBot applications, some very focused ones, and then some proteome-wide crazy stuff. Uh, and then finally, the really crazy stuff comes at the very end, where we are using um, the, an the analytical capabilities of IonBot um, to get large-scale results and then do off-the-cuff crazy stuff with these uh, results. Okay, but first and foremost, what is this mass spectrometry-based proteomics I'm yapping on about? Um, you start with a protein mixture. That can be all kinds of things, and we'll encounter a few examples. It can be a whole cell that you lie. It can be epitopes that you've diluted off uh, or washed off MHC complexes. Uh, it can be something produced in a cell that is meant to be injected into a patient. Uh, so a therapeutic, it can be lots of things. You then typically digest that mixture of proteins into smaller bits, peptides. The reason for that is simple. The proteins just are too diverse. It's not like um, nucleotide molecules, which are chemically all very similar. So you know how to deal with one, you know how to deal with all of them. Proteins are the exact opposite. They try to cover as much as possible of a physical chemical space because you need very strange one that way, very strange one that way to do actual work. They're machines and therefore they behave very badly on analytics. And the, the idea of cutting them into smaller bits means that they can be less diverse and therefore easier to handle in analytics. That's essentially the reason why we do that. Then we chuff them onto these very fancy machines, uh, liquid chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry. Um, this is one of the machines, uh, and they just cost a lot of money and do fancy stuff with physics. And they spit out fragmentation spectra, uh, by and large. And these fragmentation spectra, we then need to somehow correlate back to the original peptides that were in the sample. And these this back tracking uh, essentially is the informatic step that is fundamental, if you like, in the process. So how does that supposed to work when you take a peptide and peptide is, uh, is an amino acid sequence, so it is a peptide. It's very meta, a peptide is a peptide. And then you can fragment it in, in your thoughts and you can break it after the first P, you can break it after PE, after PEP and so forth. And you get all of these fragment ions and you can see that they get heavier, they get longer and therefore heavier as you go along. And you see that on the axis that they move towards the right as they get longer. And if you're, if you're uh, Super Mario and you jump from zero to the first peak, to the second peak, to the third peak, every time you jump, you jump the mass of an amino acid residue, which is really cool because you can now ladder sequence this thing just like we do in DNA sequencing or nucleotide sequencing. That would be fun. The problem is 
that these peptides don't just break from, say, left to right or N-terminal to C-terminal side. They also break right to left, C-terminal to uh, N-terminal side. And that gives you these dashed peaks, which are the um, fragments that you get when you get the E at the end and then the DE at the end and then so forth. And the problem is, of course, in a real spectrum, these peaks don't wave a little flag and say, I'm a B ion, I'm a Y ion, which is the, the nomenclature for these things. So you don't know which is which, and now you don't know which peak you have to jump to. Nevertheless, I would sacrifice a lot in my life to get spectra like this out of the instrument. The reality, of course, is that none of the spectra look like this. If that were the case, I would not be here having this talk with you. Spectra look a little more like this. Many of the peaks we expect are missing. They're just not there. And there's a few peaks in that spectrum, usually, that don't make any sense. The big red ones that we have no idea how they correlate to the peptide. Maybe they don't even correlate to the peptide at all. And this complicates matters greatly because now you don't even know which peak to jump to anymore. And some of the peaks could be traps, could be, could be wrong. And many of the peaks don't correspond to a single amino acid mass, but to a combination of amino acid masses. This is problematic because unfortunately these things look alike. And as soon as you have, say, a, a, a tumor of amino acids, you can fit multiple solutions on that mass delta. And that gets worse progressively as you get longer uh, bits, more missing peaks. What is the problem with that? You can see that illustrated here. You essentially get ambiguity. You get multiple possible solutions for the spectrum you're looking at. And that very quickly spirals out of control. And of course, if you have multiple interpretations of a spectrum, that essentially means you have none, right? So we want a single interpretation for the spectrum. We don't want to say this spectrum is one of 1,200 possibilities. That just doesn't fly. And so this is a really big problem, this ambiguity problem. Uh, it's our fundamental problem in this, whole, um, in this whole endeavor. How do we fix that in proteomics? Of course, we fix it by cheating. Okay, and what is our cheat? Our cheat is to restrict the number of possible sequences we permit a priori. And the way we do that is we say, hey, we're looking at a human sample, therefore we expect only human proteins, therefore let's only look at peptides that can be derived from human proteins. So we limit ourselves to the human sequence database. We filter everything down, thus resolving the potential ambiguity that exists outside of this space. How strong is that effect? Well, if you think about it, if you have a 10 amino acid um, uh, peptide, which is not uncommon, you have 20 possib possibilities for the first amino acid, 20 for the next, 20, 20. So it's 20 times 20 times 20 times 20. So the total complexity is 20 to the 10th, which is a very large number that I don't know by heart. If you compare that to the whole human proteome, all peptides within a reasonable mass range, then you have about one and a half to two million. So you go from a ridiculously large number to something that is, say, on the order of a million, which is a very small number compared to the really big one. So the ambiguity problem gets kicked out of the door very effectively. That's our trick. That's why all of this works. What is the in silico workflow? We take the database with the protein sequences, which we, of course, stole from the genomics people. So we are a kind of a parasite on the genomics world. And then we do an in silico digest, which is very easy. We know how the trypsin that I talked about that makes peptides works. So we just emulate that function, which is essentially a regular expression you run on the database. And then for each of these peptides, you construct a theoretical spectrum, which is essentially what I was doing here. This is a theoretical spectrum. The one difference is that this is already too sophisticated because my peaks have different heights. And in reality, what we've always been doing is what you can see here, all the peaks have the same height. So all peaks are equally likely. In fact, that's a very big assumption that's underlying the way that we represent things. And usually in science, we're very good at uh, uh, pushing these assumptions under the carpet, but I am here to expose them to you. We essentially make these really stupid assumptions that make no sense in real life that every fragment ion is equally likely to show up in the spectrum. And then what we do is we take an experimental spectrum. You see one at the bottom. You can clearly see not all peaks are equally likely. And then we try to match it against each of these theoretical spectra using a simple mathematical function because it's not very hard mathematics behind this. And then we give each candidate peptide a score. And then we have some elaborate mechanisms to find out whether that score is potentially significant or not. And we take the highest significant score and we say, yay, we have an identification. That's the process. Okay, and it works really well. It has served the proteomics field very well for uh, quite a bit of time. 
Um, but the problem is that nowadays we want to do fancier stuff. So we're not happy just looking at a single organism. We want to do immunopeptidomics in which we don't have the beautifully aligned uh, triptych cleavage, which is very defined, but we have all kinds of possible peptides, which means that our databases go from 1 million to 100 million to 500 million to much larger databases. We want to do proteogenomics like crazy people doing six reading frame translations of the genome trying to find new uh, expressed genes. Again, you go to hundreds of millions or billions even of sequences. You do metaproteomics where you chuck together a bunch of microbes, which again gets you hundreds of millions to billions of sequences. You do open modification searches, which suddenly starts allowing thousands of modifications to take place on each of these amino acids or on many of these amino acids, again, creating so many more possibilities. And whenever that happens, we get in trouble because now we have a very large database coming in. That means that our filter that we have put in place is much less effective. We then get many more potential peptide sequences. And I do a shortcut here because I was too lazy to come up with new sequences. I just copy pasted the existing ones. If you pay attention, that's not what happens. You get more sequence diversity in reality. But you know, that was too difficult for me to emulate. Um, and then when you run your in silico MSMS, you get a bunch of spectra, all of which start to look a little bit more alike. What is effectively happening is we are getting non-distinguishable peptide scores. All of these peptide sequences are slightly different. Can you spot the differences between them? Um, but uh, it's very difficult for your eyes to spot this, which is similar to the challenge that we have with the ambiguity, because essentially the search engine is going to say, you know what, they all look the same to me. I cannot really tell these apart anymore. So I'm very sorry, but I will not identify your spectrum because I have ambiguity. And this is logical because we started out with ambiguity as the enemy. Then we said we fixed that problem by filtering. And now we said we reduced the effectiveness of the filter. So lo and behold, our old enemy ambiguity is back. So no surprises here. This is exactly what you expect. Of course, everybody was surprised when this happens because this is exactly what you expect. Um, then how do you fix that? So we thought long and hard about this. We exposed this problem, I think, relatively nicely in 2011. And ever since, we were thinking very hard about how to fix this. And so our solution is, you know what? We'll throw machine learning at the problem because, you know, again, that's what you do. Um, and the bottom line of a long story is, yes, you can do that. And so we're not the only ones doing this anymore. Many people are doing this. You can predict what the spectrum will look like if you, sh if you throw a peptide on the instrument. You can predict that using a trained model. Here you see some of the results for that. Bottom line is, if you look at the top two spectra, the left one is a real one, the right one is a simulated one. That simulated one or predicted one is very close to the real one. Um, and we can do that for different instruments and different chemistries. That's the whole bottom part. It's not so relevant for you guys. But bottom line is, spiky bit on the left looks like spiky bit on the right, and that's very good. Yeah, so we do a good job. What this changes in our workflow is the following. We have a very large database. We have our many peptide sequences and our very many theoretical spectra, which again, we had this crazy assumption that every fragment ion is equally likely. Now we can get rid of that assumption and we can predict spectra with different peak intensities, effectively opening up the second dimension of information in our spectra. And now we can compare this to experimental spectra and we have a whole bunch of new information to disambiguate two similar or three or five or a thousand similar possibilities because we can look at the peak heights of each of these predictions and say the masses all seem to match up, match up so that's a problem but the peak heights don't make any sense given the sequence therefore it's wrong and this allows us to do a much more stringent filter and that will in turn allow us to disambiguate between these potential sequences because the spiky bits will have different heights depending on what letters are actually present. So this is the this is the whole idea behind this. So it will solve our problem. Now I'm going to convince you that it actually does because we built it and we tested it. However, we were not happy just predicting these spiky bits. We predict another property, which is called the retention time. This is where the liquid chromatography comes into play. I will not explain this in too much detail, but trust me, there's this other behavior of peptides, which is how long they spend on their way through the system. And it's another property that we can predict. It's a simple one because it's a single number. It says how many minutes before the thing comes off the, the column that we use. Uh, I won't go into the details of this algorithm. It does, a, it does a really neat trick that so far no other algorithm has duplicated. But the bottom line is we're very good at predicting this time too. Uh, not just us, but many people. And so we have two things. We have the spiky bit, the spectrum that we can predict. We can predict the retention time. 
So what happens when we use this in real life? So we went for immunopeptidomics because immunopeptidomics is hot. Immunopeptidomics actually helps people and immunopeptidomics is a great application area for what we have. Now, immunopeptides are different from the typical peptides that we get out of our research because we don't use trypsin. Actually, the immunoproteasome processes these proteins in a different way. And what you can see here is the predictive models we have in yellow. This is to predict the spiky bits. When you use them on HLA type 1 and type 2 data, you can see that the yellow box plots actually don't look so brilliant anymore. That is because these peptides are different. And if they are different, we cannot predict them very well. However, if we adapt and we learn how to predict immunopeptides based on immunopeptides as input, you see the blue and uh, red box plots, these actually become a lot better on immunopeptides. You can go one step further and say we can go to rather more generic peptides that are even less defined and add chymotrypsin, which is a different enzyme that cleaves in a different way, on top of everything else, and then you get the green box plots. And you can see that that helps for the chymotryptic data because the immune peptides, blue and red, don't do very well on the chymotryptic data, but the chymotryptic one does. Funnily enough, nearly all of these models, the blue and the green one in particular, do better on tryptic data as well, probably because they generalize better. But anyway, we can do that. We can make these predictions, and they're very helpful because this is what you get with a traditional search engine, the one that works like I originally explained, that's the line in blue there at the bottom. That line in blue is the number of identifications you get at a certain controlled false discovery rate, so amount of crap that you get back in your results. The right uh, most line is 1% FDR, which is typically used. And you can see that you barely get off the ground, right? So you get only very small amounts of data. Then you can add a machine learning algorithm on top of that, and that will actually get you the yellow line. So that's a huge improvement on a machine learning algorithm that reinterprets that data. So that's really amazing because it helps us a lot. But if you feed that machine learning scoring system with our predictions on top of it, then you get the green line. And so you get almost again the same gains when you employ this uh, approach. The other thing, and this is what we had not expected, but is really cool, is that you can go to the line on the left and that's the 0.1% FDR. That's a tenfold increase in specificity. And you can get 10%, uh, so this tenfold uh, uh, increase in specificity without sacrificing that many identifications. That is really cool if you want to go to translational applications. Uh, the motto being, let us not inject crap into patients. Okay, so let's try to keep that clean. Um, it, for those of you who are wondering what the red line is, this is our closest competitor, Prozit. Those of you who are in the CompMS have heard a lot about Prozit. They published a nature communications paper on exactly the same application in 2020 or 2021. I now forgot exactly when. Um, and we actually outperformed them at 1% FDR, the classical, but we dramatically outperformed them at the 0.1% FDR, showing that there's a little bit more stretch in our particular approach. So this is really good, and this is um, something that we can actually replicate across multiple data sets. This is multiple data sets. You see the green bits at the bottom each time is all the stuff that we find in addition. But you also see some red stuff, and the red stuff means that we throw some identifications out. Um, I'll come back to that in a second, but we also had help from Christine Carapito and her lab in Strasbourg who made specific data sets for us on immunopeptidomics just to make sure we had completely independent data to validate our approach on. And we see exactly the same results, classical search engine in blue, uh, machine learning search engine in green, and our search engine in orange, and you're the visualization crowd, so you realize my colors are now swapped and a palette swap is a capital sin, and I apologize. But anyway, orange is better than everything else. We are orange, we win, we are happy, okay? That's the bottom line. Um, and so it's very um, translatable across multiple different data sets. It's very generic. We can see how well our uh, stuff works. The classical search engine features for the machine learning are on the right-hand side in yellow. Then the retention time is in green and then all the fragmentation features are in blue. What you can see is that the retention time features are simple. It's a single number. So there's one really big and very important feature. Whereas that importance is more spread out for the correlation between the spiky bits because there's more correlations to be done. And so they kind of share responsibility in a way. But if you see on the right, the summary statistic is that um, the spiky bit comparison is really the most important one, followed by the classical search engine features, and then uh, that is closely trailed by the retention time. So these things actually really work, and the machine learning algorithms really love this data because it allows them to tell right from wrong. 
Um, we can also see this effect when we start messing up the data. So suppose you screw your data up, the algorithms compensate. I won't go into too much detail on this, but uh, it was nice to see. You can also see that the stuff that we throw out, remember the red stuff that we throw out, the green stuff is all the stuff that we think is good. And then you can see the difference with retention time on the left, and you can see the correlation with uh, uh, spiky bits on the right. And you can, so the left one should be around zero, the one on the right should be as close as possible to one. You see that the green stuff is where you expect it to be. And then you see if you, pay careful attention as you see a red curve and a blue curve. The blue curve is known nonsense that we inject into the system to see the performance of our system. And the red curve is the stuff we throw out. And I hope you will agree with me that the stuff that we throw out, the red stuff, looks a lot like the blue stuff. And the blue stuff is certifiably nonsense. So we actually do manage to get rid of the nonsense um, in the data, which is probably why we can go down to 0.1% FDR. Right, that's uh, that's probably the reason. We also cross all HLA types, which is really cool. Uh, in green, you see our contributions; they spread out nicely across all the HLA types, which is really nice. And we also show that the results that we get actually correspond to the HLA types you expect. So the peptides we gain have the same signature as the original signature found in the papers that uh, delivered the data. And then the peptides that we throw out, the red ones, they have this very random uh, composition, which is exactly what you expect. And then the biggest gains actually with these algorithms you get at the lowest amounts of intensity. So the topmost part of that plot, which is really cool because it shows that we can dig into the signals that so far have eluded identification. So this kind of stuff finds a lot of new stuff. That's the key thing. Uh, we actually use this in uh, in a clinical trial now with collaborators at Ghent University Hospital. So Karim Vermala and Bart van der Kerkhoven are the, the medical doctors doing this um, where we, uh, try to get uh, cancer new epitopes for some non-small cell lung cancer. And actually these things are being put in practice in patients in Ghent University Hospital today, which is really cool, I think. It's also scary. This approach that you see now is completely based on uh, sequencing. And um, we now supplemented this with uh, Francis Impens, who runs the proteomics core facility uh, back in the place where I am. Uh, we now supplemented this with proteomics data, and then we can do the overlap between the neo-epitopes predicted from the sequencing and then found with the mass spec. When you find an overlap, that is when you go and take it to the patient. So there are now patients whose tumors are being treated in this uh, approach in a clinical trial. We also can do this with generic peptides, um, not just immunopeptides. You see a similar curve. I won't go into much detail, but it's nice to see that uh, there's a lot of stretch still in this approach. Okay, so that was a simple way of doing this. We can do a more complex thing, uh, essentially getting rid of any classical search engine and scoring functions. The way we do that is we take our two predictions. You can see them there. So the spiky bit in green, MS2 pip, and then in red is the retention time prediction. We can also fit other models. Huh? So we're doing that now with other stuff, but it's not that important. And then we give all of that to a machine learning algorithm and we tell the machine learning algorithm, um, figure out the scoring function. The, the result of this is that you get a really, really good engine that is very sensitive, highly accurate, and it can do open modification searches. So it can start looking for PTMs, post-translational modifications on proteins. Why is that important? You see that here in blue, you see the traditional search with normal uh, limited modifications and in orange, the open modification search. And what's the carry home message is very simple. The orange curves are much, or orange bars are much bigger than the blue bar. So there's lots of modifications that you're missing if you don't look for them. Um, what is slightly scary for proteomics people is that if you look in detail, you see red stuff that gets kicked out from the blue bars by the algorithm and gets replaced by something else. And you can see that the replacement makes sense on the bottom right. That's the retention time alignment. You can see that on the left is the red stuff that gets thrown out. You see that the retention time alignment is really bad. It's everywhere except on the diagonal. And then on the right, you see the replacement and the replacement identification is spot on the diagonal. So fundamentally telling you what you have kicked out was indeed wrong. And it's about 8% of your data. So that's not good news actually. Um, you can also see that if you compare it to our competitors, we gain a lot by using the predictions. So the predictions are really key in making this thing as sensitive and as accurate as it is, uh, and also as specific as it is. I will not go into too much detail because this is not that important. And we're now coupling all these things together so that we can do open modification, peptidomics and immunopeptidomics research, which gets a lot of people in the immunology field really, really excited because modifications on immunopeptides is something that uh, hasn't been explored at all in any amount of detail. 
Now, that search engine, I went quickly through that because I'm more interested in showing you the applications. So what happens when you use that search engine on stuff? So we started again with Christine Carapito's group in Strasbourg. They are doing work on um, antibody profiling. So monoclonal antibodies are therapeutics in cancer, and they're becoming therapeutics in um, people with autoimmune disorders. Now, with cancer people, there was never a problem because essentially these poor people were dying and nobody really cared about what they were injecting into them because, hey, they were dying anyway. I'm sorry to sound extremely, extremely nasty about that, but that's fundamentally how the pharma companies looked at this. But people with autoimmune disorders tend to be young people who will take this drug for the rest of their life. Now there is a problem because when you, when you make these things, you make them in cells. And then you do lots of purification steps, which are kind of symbolized here. And then after all these purification steps, you hope to get the pure antibody. But you never do, because there's always still a little bit of the original host cell that makes it through all the filtration steps. Now, if you keep injecting that into your body over time, you will likely at some point become allergic to the stuff that you're injecting. As soon as that happens, you're in trouble. You don't want to trigger the immune system of somebody with an autoimmune disorder. Um, and then also the drug becomes ineffective. So these host cell proteins or HCPs that come from the production system, you want to get rid of them. One way to get rid of them is to at least be able to find them in the first place. They're challenging, however, because you're looking at an antibody which is present in enormous amounts and then very, very vague traces of these host cell proteins. So you have to somehow find trace level HCP proteins amongst superabundant antibodies. So you need extreme sensitivity there. But our algorithm was very sensitive. Remember I mentioned that, that it was very good at finding these low abundance signals. And that's exactly what you see. So if you compare yellow, and now I am color consistent because it's similar to the immunopeptide uh, yellow, which was a search engine plus a machine learning algorithm, you get a certain amount of identifications. If you use IamBot, you get more. Somewhat scarily, the overlap is not perfect. That imperfect overlap probably means that some of the yellow ones are wrong um, or our algorithm might be blind to them. Probably a combination of the two. We are still looking into that in more detail. And we also find some modifications, which are exactly the kind of stuff that we kind of expect to find on these things. But fundamentally, it really helps a lot to try and search these things with this algorithm. And Pharma is very interested in this, obviously. Another thing that you can do, and this was a collaboration with um, uh, the Bonaldi lab in Milano, at the European Univer uh, Institute for Cancer Research, who wanted to look at histones. So they came up with this a, a very elaborate filtering strategy, which I'm not going to go into, because they were actually going to validate whatever crazy stuff came out of our algorithm, and they did not like being um, sent off on a wild goose chase. So to make a long story short, they actually found a new modification, which is uh, threonine acetylation. And then they already showed preliminarily that when you use an inhibitor of histone deacetylases, you actually see an effect on this modification, which means that it's probably not a ghost. And it's probably real. Uh, it responds to panobinostat, which stops the HDAX from doing their job, which means more acetylations accumulate, and you actually see that accumulation of the acetylation on these residues. So, hey, presto, new modification of histones, new epigenetic regulator, uh, courtesy of IamBot. Thank you very much. Now, this was very small scale, very specialized, then a little bit bigger looking at the histones. Now, now all the breaks are off. What happens when we look at all of the public data we have available? We just take a bunch of data, run it through the system and see what happens. We first tested this for phosphorylation with about 2000 raw files, about 60 million spectra, which is a small amount ran it through IamBot and then looked for phosphorylations. So we find tons of phosphorylations. You see the numbers on the lower right hand side. And then we made those available in a website called Scope3P, where we have some really silly visualizations. So you have linear sequence and then all the phosphocytes. If they're blue, they're mapped onto the structure. If they're red, there is no structure. Although now we have alpha fold in the system, which means we have structure for nearly everything now. You have a table with the provenance of the information, the 3D structure with the phosphocytes highlighted in blue. Again, blue because they were blue above as well. You can interact with that in any way you want. That's an interactive viewer. And then we have this really horrible circular, uh, concentric circular plot with biophysical properties, which essentially serves no purpose apart from looking somewhat pretty and disquieting. Um, fundamentally, the tables behind that are very useful because they allow machine learning. And so we decided to make a visualization probably because otherwise nobody would know the data was there. Now, that was phosphorylation, but phosphorylation alone is boring and we want to do more. Um, so what we did is we took 600 million mouse spectra, we took a billion human spectra, ran them through IamBot, found tons and tons of stuff. And this is work that has been done um, 
or that has been super that's now being supervised by Enrico uh, Massignani, who's a postdoc in my lab and who's actually sitting at the in the room at the back trying to look inconspicuous. Um, and Enrico has done some preliminary analysis. So look at the post-translational modifications on human and mouse, and you see that they actually are very similar. Uh, the one difference that we can find is the gluratilation. I have no idea what that is. I'm not a protein biochemist and it's very preliminary, but by and large, mice look like humans when it comes to PTMs, which is cool. Uh, it would be nice to do this with much more different uh, species as well and see what kind of differences we can find, of course. And then we also looked at whether PTMs show a preference for disordered regions. And then what we find is anything that's offset to the right is phosphorylation related. So it's either phosphorylation or can be confused with phosphorylation by the algorithm. And so phosphorylation seems to like disordered regions, but all the other stuff seems to not care so much, except maybe for methylations. So that's a very interesting finding, I think, um, immediately there. Now, the idea was we have the scope 3P, remember, with the simple visualizations. And then naively, we said, now what we do is we just make a mock-up. And so this is what it will look like when we put all the PTMs on it. And it's going to be beautiful and everything is going to be great. And we do a happy dance. Um, we built the system. The system is operational and the system looks like this. So this is scary because there's lots of modifications possible on this protein. When I show my proteomics colleagues this, it gets very quiet in the room. They do not like this because it is a bit of a paradigm crusher, this one. It says your proteins don't look like the proteins you think they are. Your proteins are much more dynamic than you think they are. And we have no idea on how to show that kind of stuff to people because this is really bad. At the DAX tool, uh, BioVis, uh, this was immediately within five seconds, it was Christian's the shish kebab plot. And I think that's about, uh, that's about the best description you can give it. If you zoom in, it becomes a little bit more manageable. Nevertheless, it's still pretty, uh, pretty awkward uh, to look at this kind of data. So we drastically new, need new ways to annotate multiple types of modifications on protein sequences. And then keeping in mind that we also have multiple proteins. Also on the 3D structure, you see cartoon on the left, space fill on the right. Whenever something is dark blue, it has multiple modifications. The first thing to realize is, it's not really that informative because multiple modifications, what does it mean? Uh, second thing is that right-hand space fill site, that protein is modified to the hilt everywhere. Yeah? So your proteins do not look like the proteins you think they are. So there's a lot of biovis challenges right there. Very happy to talk to anybody who wants to do something. Now, two other crazy things that we are doing just to round off. This is work by Tina uh, Gleis in my group. She has developed a machine learning model to use uh, the proteomics data to predict tissue of origin, which works really well. It makes sense because the proteome is the executive component of the cell. And if the cell is from a different tissue, it has a different function. Therefore, it should have different machinery. Therefore, it has different proteins. So we should see it in the proteome. And hey, presto, you do. There's some confusion here and there, which is almost funny. Skin looks like colon, skin looks like lung. That's all logical. They're ectoderm. They're layers of the body that are in contact with the outside world. They have a relatively high turnover. And so they have similar machinery in-house. And the overlap is vague, so that's what you expect. Yeah, so the stuff of our bodies that is in contact with the outside world has some commonalities on the proteome level. And then, for instance, endometrium and esophagus look like smooth muscle, but that's because both of these tissues contain a lot of smooth muscle and either the sampling is not pure or there is some bleed in of the cell types or whatever that uh, causes these to look vaguely like each other, but very vaguely. But you can see there's a bit of meta information coming through here, which is interesting, which is nice to see because the algorithm doesn't know anything about this and finding these kind of things is encouraging. When you look at these last three, you can see that actually the proteins that separate them that are unique, which is the, the primary colors on the outside of this um, uh, three-way Venn diagram, there are not that many proteins in fact, which gives us a really good idea of how successful we will be with single cell proteomics and digital tissue deconvolution. Fundamentally, looking at plots like these, we will be able to do this. On a single cell with proteomics, we can nowadays routinely get 700 to 1,000 proteins without too much effort, uh, and we need only 300 say, to uniquely classify a tissue, probably also a cell type, which probably means that we should be able to pull this off and do digital tissue deconvolution in proteomics, just like we do in SC RNA seq This I really like, though. What you see is PTMs on the bottom. You see tissues on the y-axis. If you take a certain tissue, which is a horizontal line, you see a unique barcode. PTMs are different between different tissues. 
So it's not just the proteins that are different. Also, the way the machinery is operated is different in different tissues. This I find wildly exciting. The other thing I find wildly exciting, and I hope I'm not offending anyone, and if I do, I'm sorry. This plot does not contain an iota of information that is accessible to somebody sequencing nucleotides. I'm sorry. This is in the realm of proteomics and proteomics alone. So I like this. I like it when we can finally do something where somebody will not tell me I can do this cheaper, faster, and better with sequencing. Because there's no way you can get at this information. And it is fundamental biology because it's the regulation live on the spot of your proteins, yeah, of your machinery of life. So I like this. It's cool. Um, and then finally, this is a work by Michaela Cotrulli, who's actually sitting over there and who also gave a talk on this in a lot of detail. So I won't say too much about this. Um, uh, who's from the Lars Juliansen lab. And Lars is also sitting there. So hi, Lars. Um, and where we, where we, we met at the meeting. And uh, after 30 seconds of Michaela telling me what she was doing, I said, you have to come to Ghent and you have to process our data. Because she had this wonderful variational autoencoder system to find, pro to find associations in single cell RNA sequencing. So associations between genes. And I said, yeah, but you can just run that on our proteomics data. It's not going to be hard. It turned out not to be that hard. Or Michaela is very capable. Let's, let's leave that option open as well. Um, and she managed to run all of that. And this is the, the long and the short of it. Um, there's a very nice bioarchive paper out uh, now as well. You can see how many pairs of associating proteins we find, and then a false discovery rate estimated by CAC correspondence, uh, and then how many. You can see that the SCRNA-seq is actually better in a way because it's the green curves, and the solid green curve is the result from her algorithm, and it has a nice gamma look, right? So it goes straight up and then to the right, which means lots of good stuff and then the bad stuff. The proteomics data in blue is a little bit fuzzier because it kind of bleh, eh? so it, it's, not, it's not so beautiful. But when you turn them into posterior error probabilities based on keg mapping, and you superimpose the two data sets or, or kind of uh, group them together, you get the orange line, which is really cool. So you get the best of two worlds. You get two complementary approaches that have access to complementary information, and you get a really good way of assessing protein association information from both single cell RNA sequencing and proteomics data. So instead of fighting with these SC RNA sequencing guys, we can now embrace each other and dance into the night. So I like that. That's good. Now, uh, very last uh, bit of information. I was in a meeting with a colleague of mine in KU Leuven, Jos Simkovic. You can see his picture there right next to Michaela's. Jost is not in the room. And so um, Jost is a guy who uh, cares about chaperones. And so I told him about this database that Michaela had made. And so he said, oh, so I like chaperones. I have a list of 300 human chaperone proteins. And I want to know the clientele of these 300 chaperones. And you're telling me you can do that? I said, I'm telling you Michaela can do it. And he said, OK, I'll send you the file. And Michaela was on Teams. So I, I went on Teams and I said, Michaela, I've got this crazy guy who has a file and he wants to know everybody who associates with that. And so, yeah, sure, I sent the file to Michaela. Five minutes later in the meeting, I get the results because she had the network, so it wasn't that difficult to query. I send it to your student, send it to his end, to a postdoc, and then the postdoc came back with this fuzzball. And this fuzzball shows you all of the interactions. Now, I don't know the first thing about this, so I have no clue whether this is good or bad, but your comment was, and he's a relatively mellow guy, his comment was, cool. Um, because he could see all of the usual suspects here as well as some new stuff. And so he really likes this because apparently it shows actual clientele and actual interesting things. So they're now going deeper into this map. But it's really interesting to have this at our disposal. The one thing that I haven't talked about, but that you should now think about, is we do not just have proteins associating with proteins. We have modified forms of proteins associating with modified forms of proteins, which leads to the thing that Michaela said at the end of her talk, and I'm going to say at the end of my talk, which is modification-dependent protein association networks. That too will require an interesting kind of visualization. So if you're still wide enough, awake enough, and you are a superhuman person if you still are, if that makes any sense to you, modification dependent protein association networks that should make your visualization taste buds titillate i hope now to end up remember i talked to you about the modern era in proteomics i hope to have convinced you that with all these tools coming out not just from my group but from other group as well 
um, we are looking at really redefining the way we look at the proteome and the functional organization of the proteome. And we're in a modern era. There's lots of optimism. Um, there's a new way of looking at things, but it will require a new art. It will require a new visualization, which is why I'm here to try and be the prophet of that movement and to make you guys uh, interested in that. So to celebrate, I turned this with a stupid web tool into one of my favorite modern artists' artworks, and I made a Kandinsky of the network. I would hang that in my living room. The downside is I would probably have to pay my colleague uh, a lot of money because he owns the copyright on the network and I'm not going to pay him any money. That will be a, a black day in, uh, in history when I do that. Anyway, thank you very, very much for your attention. Here are all the collaborators and the nice people in my group who actually do the work. You can see I put Michaela there, but she has a different colored bar because she's actually not in my group. She She's in Lars's group, but I stole her here last, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, thank you all very, very much. Happy to take any questions. Super fascinating talk. On the graph, you show that uh, some residues has multiple PDNs. And that was really surprised. Just want to double check. That's on a single peptide in a single sample or that's across many samples? That's across all samples because you okay. cannot, <laughs> te <laughs> technically, technically you cannot, well, it, uh, it gets complicated, but typically you don't get two modifications at the same time on the same site. However, in a single cell, you can have say 5,000 copies of a protein, mm, right. 4,500 who have nothing on them on that particular site, and then 200 who have that modification, five who have another modification, and 70 who have yet another modification. So that is something we don't really realize. And by looking at this union of all possible things, what we are looking at is a potential for modification, but a potential that has apparently some basis in reality because we find it somewhere. And then the question becomes, how often does this happen? How much of the protein is changing? What is the function of this? Is there a function? Is this random chemistry in the cell for which we find lots of evidence that there's a lot of lots of random chemistry in the cell which you cannot stop um, how is this regulated is there an enzyme that takes it off is there an enzyme that puts it on all of this kind of questions now come up yeah. right and can you speak a little bit about then downstream if let's say the experiment has i track tnt how does the quantification work with regards to these special these ptms um, okay, so if there is TMT, our algorithm can handle TMT and will give you the quants for the TMT. If you're talking about differential usage of PTMs, yeah. that is something that hasn't really completely been cleared out in proteomics, but I have a PhD student working on nothing else but that, who is co-supervised with Levin Clement, who makes MSQ ROP, which is one of the uh, leading packages in proteomics quantification today. Um, and so we're heavily working on that. Um, now it's summer holiday, so unfortunately Nina is on holiday from Friday. So yeah, maybe September, October, we hope to have the first really nice results from this and then hope to chuck them on bioarchive somewhere this autumn. So that's kind of our timeline for having differential modification usage algorithms. Very okay. exciting. Yeah. Looking forward. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, so that's why I said Nina is on holiday from Friday. I was being very specific. <laughs> Hi, um, great talk. Uh, I am actually an industry in bispecific antibody discovery, so I was very interested in this, as you probably know. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you've looked at clinical antibody sequences and um, how that relates to the clinical data of an immunogenic response to that drug therapeutic. Yeah. So this is something that we would love to now also do with Christine. Um, so she's the one who's doing the host cell protein. She has all the know-how on that front. We just have some software, right? They're, they're the real wizards. Um, one of the things as well is to actually look at the product because your, um, your antibody can also carry modifications, will carry modifications. In fact, in some cases, must carry modifications to be active. And characterizing that is something that we would love to get into. Um, the biggest problem is getting your hands on decent samples because usually people sit on that. Um, but to set up collaborations with, uh, with companies is something that we would love to do and see what happens. Um, very specifically, uh, I'm on the technology campus in Ghent and then Ablinks, which is one of the bigger companies, um, is, is also doing that kind of stuff. I have a meeting with them very soon to talk about specifically this. Uh, but it's definitely something we're super interested in because we should be able to help out with that. Uh, and the nice thing is, because it's relatively sensitive, we can even find host cell proteins against the background. That would mean that even if small amounts of these proteins are present, we would still 
roughly be able to pick these up, especially when you use the right kind of protocols like Christine uses in her lab. So it's a good match there. Uh, so if you're interested, feel free to come and talk to me. Yeah. Great, thank you. One more question. Um, I, I was doing some cozy management, so I probably missed it. But you had uh, the, uh, the clinical trial that's starting yes. today. Okay, how do you use um, mass spec there and to, to, to discern what? So the, the clinical trial is when you have people who, and this is very, so now let's get into the nitty gritty of this for a moment because it's interesting. So proteomics is a really bad tool to treat people with cancer with. The it's reason expensive. for- Expensive. No, it's not just that. The problem is it's very limited in its application domain. So you need to have a resectable tumor, which isn't too advanced yet to be kind of outside of, uh, of being able to help these people. Some people have very highly metastatic tumors and then there's very little anybody can do at that stage. So th the tumor has to be resectable. It has to be big enough because we need a lot of material, unfortunately, for these kind of studies. Um, and so it's a very, very limited subset of patients that is, that is uh, amenable to this. However, there is hope. Um, the, the, the trick being this Midrix uh, trial is based on the fact that certain people have similar molecular deficits in their cells, which leads to the cancer, which creates certain discernible neoepitopes. So what you get is you get a semi-personalized medicine. You could do uh, a screening based on the nucleotide sequencing and say, you've got this type of neoepitope, which we hope to then show actually occurs in multiple people with resectable tumors. That's our proteomics input. And then from that, you can start building these, these panels of markers and say, if you have the following markers, you will respond to the following immune therapy. And then you can treat a lot more patients, including the ones for whom you don't have to push the whole proteomics pipeline through. So cost is not really the end problem. It is a little bit more expensive, but the sequencing is also not dirt cheap and huh? doing all of this kind of stuff. So it's not that big a problem. The biggest problem is in fact, you need a lot of material. And so somebody with an early stage cancer, they simply do not have enough material and nobody is going to uh, do the ethics on let's wait until the tumor is big enough to treat you, right? So to be very stupid about this. Um, but, but this idea of finding molecular subtypes on the neoepitope level is very, very interesting. And they showed in Midrix that it's possible already. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm, I'm a visualization person, not a uh, proteomics person, but you listed MS, MS on your slide. Is yes. that something that uh, uh, can help solve the ambiguity problem? Is that, uh, can, can you explain okay. that, that part of it? Yeah, so the MS, MS is essentially the fragmentation process by which you create the, the spiky spectrum. So it, it is definitely helping the, the disambiguation because the problem is if you just take the mass of the intact peptide, which is MS, not the MS-MS or tandem MS, then you just have a composition. You essentially say everything in this peptide together adds up to this mass, which gives you so many possibilities that it's completely unworkable. That's why we do MS and then break it and then measure the fragments, which is MS break MS again hence MS slash MS, and that allows us to get some sequence information, but still retains a lot of ambiguity. There's a special thing that you can do, which is MS to the third, which is MS, break, MS, break a small bit again, and then MS, but it's not really helping you with missing peaks usually. So that is very rarely used for identification alone, and so that doesn't really help. Fundamentally, the problem that we have is physics. Physics with a bit of chemistry, with a flavor of chemistry, when the instrument fragments the peptides, the peptide just, it's like when you take a hammer and you smash something. So if you hit a little bit too hard, your fragments will all be very small. If you hit a little bit too weakly, you will get too big fragments, but it's very difficult to get a beautiful spread of fragments. And it's especially difficult when you have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of analytes, all of which have different binding energies within their sequences. And so fundamentally, we're just smashing jackhammer, big hammers uh, into, um, into stuff and then hoping that whatever fragments happen are, are reasonably good. And they are reasonably good, but they are not good enough to be non-ambiguous. So I don't think we're going to fix that problem anytime soon. Um, yeah. So thank you for the talk. Um, I'm also a CS person, so I won't even pretend that I understand half of what you were talking about. Um, however, when you showed the um, the, the structure visualization with the uh, all the uh, PTMs uh, on top, um, what exactly, uh, from a visualization perspective, what would you be most interested in? 
um, the changes in the physical chemical properties on the surface or on the actual structural changes or all of that or what what would be interesting what would you what would you help you to make more of this okay so multiple layers so you you already put two very interesting layers there which is how did the biophysics respond to all of this right and that's also one of the reasons why we have these biophysics there right um so biophysical responses brilliant would be wonderful yeah um second thing is structural changes mind god huh? this is this is mind-blowing if we know that that would be amazing we're actually we have a project on looking on uh, at these kind of things we find modifications in poorly accessible or completely inaccessible sites which seem to indicate the protein can hinge somehow you chuck a modification on that now it can't close again so these modifications probably have very serious structural consequences, but some of these might have subtle structural con consequences, which may be sufficient to really mess up a protein-protein interaction or which can attenuate a protein-protein interaction. I've had some very interesting discussions about that lately. So that would be really cool. On a more fundamental level, just for a, bi a protein biochemist, classical protein biochemist would preferably like to see what is the potential for my protein? What kind of crazy stuff happens to my protein? And they would like to see something like this, not too much dynamics, not too much crazy stuff, but just which modifications, where, and which sites have different ones and which are the different ones, which compete with each other. And then one thing that we're trying to figure out is we're trying to figure out a way of finding the, um, um, well, how can I say there's a communication between the modifications on the same protein. So for instance, uh, the green one that you see there is only present if the blue one on the lower right hand side is also present. So these kind of links between things. So and that would just be mapping these modifications in an interpretable way on the protein to look at the potential it has and the relations between the different modifications. That too could be extremely powerful. Because a typical protein biochemist says, I love this protein, now tell me all I know about this protein. And so even that at that fundamental level. And then these two things on top, and then I, I'm sure if we have a few beers, we can come up with some other stuff. Um, but these would already be amazing. Yeah. Sounds good. And speaking about beers, just a last remark, since you were your beautiful actual t-shirt today, uh, the follow-up meeting was uh, approved uh, two weeks ago. So ah, cool. Am I on the list? Because otherwise, I don't think this is cool. I'm so I just want to say, so we need to find the right mushroom so that we get you in the room again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, how many mushrooms do I buy and where do I send them? Maybe we can talk about that over the years later on today. Exactly.